Marker. And action. This is Behind the Bells, the show that takes you behind the magic of your favorite Christmas movies and shows. Within the background of every Santa Claus, reindeer, and stocking is a story. Where did it come from? Our Christmas movie expert will unravel all of that and give you the full story. Sit back and enjoy another episode with Robert Nicholas. Merry Monday, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Bells. I'm your host, Robert Nicholas, and I'll be taking you on another one-horse open sleigh ride into the world of Christmas movies. Now that I'm back from a long break, it's time to get back into the swing of things. Yes, I do have a deep dive coming up next, but today, I thought I'd take some time to talk about another movie that also has an interesting connection to my honeymoon. It's time for another Almost Christmas movie. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Are you sure? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Almost Christmas! This is where I take a movie that has some kind of element of Christmas, but isn't seen as a traditional Christmas movie. The plot doesn't have to take place around the holidays. It doesn't even need to be consequential to the plot. Christmas, in some form, just needs to be referenced at least once. This allows me to explore movies outside of the typical holiday genre. Don't call this a deep dive, but more like a wade. A wade in which I share my personal experience and make my own observations and analysis. So what are we going to look back at that has to do with my honeymoon? On December 28th, my beautiful new wife and I flew down to Miami so that we could board a Royal Caribbean cruise ship to go on a 10-day voyage. This route took us on the cruise's company's private island called Coco Cay and the countries of Curacao, Aruba, and Jamaica before arriving back in Miami on January 7th. It should also be noted that during the voyage, this landed us on another holiday, New Year's Day. And yes, there is a big movie that was also set on a boat during New Year's. But unlike mine that was fun and exciting, this cruise would end in tragedy and disaster. Today's movie may be far from jolly and Christmas-like, but it still has that connection. It's time to dive into the ocean and look at the 1972 Irwin Allen produced disaster movie, The Poseidon Adventure. Now you may wonder how this disaster movie fits into the almost Christmas category. The answer lies in the backdrop of the New Year's celebration and the thematic elements intertwined with the holiday spirit. While not a traditional Christmas movie, The Poseidon Adventure offers a unique perspective on the challenges and unexpected events that can arise during festive times. Nothing is truly safe, even around Christmas time. Within The Poseidon Adventure, the ship itself looks like any other cruise no decorations or Christmas activities. Some may argue that this is because this takes place after Christmas and there would be no need for anything Christmas related. This is all part of that debate of just how soon is too soon to take down your decorations, but I'm not going down that rabbit hole today. I will add though that on my cruise, all the decorations were up. Not some, but all of them including the large Christmas tree within the main promenade deck that was essentially a giant shopping mall. My wife and I even got a picture in front of that to commemorate the night before New Year's, in which it would be its last night before everything went back to its year-round decorations. But speaking of trees, the main Christmas connection in the Poseidon Adventure is that of the Grand Christmas Tree. Okay, Grand is a stretch. That's because it's a faux tree. This feels like a common idea as I can't imagine how much water it would take to feed one of those real kind of trees, especially on a cruise ship that already has to do a lot of engineering to get fresh water for the guests. But unlike the Christmas tree my wife and I saw this year, the Poseidon Adventure gives us what has to be the largest freaking aluminum tree. So can Grand even be in the same sentence? 
it's certainly more kitsch. The tree on display in its awful glory within the dining room, where a majority of the guests are ringing in the new year. It lacks any sense of trying to be a real tree in favor of metallic green strings, brown tinsel covering it, and a collection of yellow striped ornaments. It has to be one of the worst Christmas trees I have seen in any Christmas related media. Even worse than the inflatable tree from the animated grandma got run over by a reindeer special. But, and I can't believe I'm saying this, it actually ends up saving lives. How it does so, we'll get into that, but I want to talk about the movie and some of its history. But I also wanted to connect it to my honeymoon and just what New Year's means to me this year. So, let's keep your hands and arms inside the vehicle at all times. Let's go for a ride. Good morning, everyone, and welcome on board the SS Behind the Bells. This is your podcast cruise director, Robert, and I want to give you an update to today on the Digital Sea. We'll be cruising at around zero knots, and I assume most of you are either lying down or listening to this while you're in your car. You can expect some interesting facts about the big name behind the Poseidon Adventure, Urban Allen, and how his disaster movies became a big thing for a while along which we'll also take a look into how I came across this movie in the first place. Bingo will commence at 15.13pm, and a buffet will be open all night long. Enjoy your cruise, and have a nice day. Before you leave and hit the buffet, let me tell you about my personal history with the Poseidon Adventure. It's time to admit that before the episode, I would actually had never seen the movie even though I knew of it. I'd seen a lot of Irwin Allen movies like The Towering Inferno and The Swarm, so I was aware of the impact of the star-studded disaster movies of the 70s. So why did it take me so long to get around to it? It honestly has to do with another cruise ship disaster movie that's probably one of the most well-known movies out there, Titanic. If you didn't grow up in the 90s like I did, I can't stress how much of a cultural impact it had. Whether you liked the movie or not, I myself am in the camp of liking it. Titanic was a game changer with special effects and what could be shown on the big screen. It was a beautiful marriage of practical effects and computer animation. Today, it would probably just be all CGI just to make it easier on the cast and crew. But even going back to it in 2024, it's still an engaging watch, making me appreciate the work that James Cameron did to really put us into the ill-fated ship. It, of course, was also the highest grossing movie for many years. It managed to beat out the original Star Wars in Jurassic Park, taking the title until Cameron outdid himself with Avatar in 2009. So why am I bringing up Titanic? Because the movie and its impact were very similar to the Poseidon Adventure. Both were filled with celebrities. Both were high-budgeted disaster epics. Both ended up with a lot of Oscar nominations and both were big hits with critics and audiences. The Poseidon Adventure grossed an impressive $93 million on a $5 million budget, taking the number two spot on the box office chart, just under the even more successful mob epic The Godfather, but still ranking higher than the Barbra Streisand comedy What's Up Doc and the Burt Reynolds-led thriller Deliverance. I still hear a lot about the latter three, but not a ton on the Poseidon Adventure. And we need to remember that the Poseidon Adventure came out during a point in which disaster movies were going through its own golden age. Disaster movies were nothing new in the 1970s. The idea of creating these larger than life movies about people facing an impending doom is probably one of the most obvious crowd pleasers to make. A lot of people can relate to themselves or even their whole family having to face a catastrophic force that pushes them to their highest physical and mental points. What's the point of everything if we can't get away from something that could kill us all? Class, race, position, and religion no longer play roles. It's the survival of the fittest making it to the end. Disaster movies were prevalent in the 30s with more natural catastrophes like earthquakes in San Francisco and city fires within Old Chicago, 
while the 50s took us into the atomic wonders with the War of the Worlds and Godzilla. But the cinema landscape had changed by the 70s, with less people going to the movies, detached from the style of epics that had fallen out of fashion. A rise in TV certainly didn't help either. Cinema was going through a transition into the new wave period that's way too extensive to cover. But a part of that would be the way disaster movies were made. And the first of the party in 1970 was a thriller called Airport. Airport, the year's most widely read novel, becomes today's most exciting, most timely motion picture. Airport, big scale in every way, has the biggest all-star cast ever assembled for a single universal motion picture. Dean Martin is pilot Vernon Demarest, loved by stewardess Jacqueline Bissett and by his wife, Barbara Hale. You're sure? Do you mean am I sure I'm pregnant? Or am I sure you're the father? Burt Lancaster is airport manager Mel Bakersfeld at the crisis stage with his socialite wife, Donna Winter. A week ago, I didn't... Now, how many people remember this movie? If you're below the age of 40, then you may remember a famous spoof movie by the Zucker Brothers, Airplane. Airport was the movie it was satirizing. Airport, written and directed by the same guy behind Miracle on 34th Street, George Seaton, adapted the same name novel, which followed the lives of a variety of people, both the crew and the passengers, having to deal with a severe snowstorm that suspends operations, but also has to deal with a bomb explosion on the airplane. It sounds a lot like a lot of disaster movies today, right? A lot of tropes that we would see for most disaster movies from now on would actually come from here. A large-scale event that surrounds smaller dilemmas of people, a mix of every man and professionals, a hero who ends up being the one to take leadership, and of course, the use of a lot of major stars. Airport filled up with Burt Lancaster, Dean Martin, Gene Sebring, George Kennedy, Helen Hayes, and Van Heffling. Some of these names may not be familiar, but Airport was lucrative to both character actors that played memorable sidekicks and faded aging stars that could see a revival by taking part in something that could be a potential blockbuster. Airport was also a big hit, perhaps not with critics who were mixed on it, but audiences that saw it as a big screen spectacle that couldn't be replicated on TV at the time. It grossed $128 million against a $10 million budget and received a ton of Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. When it was up on Netflix last year, I gave it a watch and it was better than I thought it was going to be. Its pacing may be pretty slow for a modern audience, but it kept me engaged thanks to its charming stars and a plot that, well, kept me thinking how a story like this would function post-September 11. This set not just a genre in motion as a standard to follow, it also set the course for a film producer to follow as his keys to success. This guy was Irwin Allen. And this is Hollywood's Morning. master magician, NATO's acclaimed Morning, producer of the year, Irwin Allen. Hello. After that kind of an introduction, nothing less than magic and miracles will do. So, for openers, here I am up on the screen. But believe it or not, I'm also down there in the audience with you. Irwin Allen can be described as a bigger budgeted Roger Corman. Both were guys who made a lot of movies based on recent headlines. Both were keen on strict budgets while offering spectacles. Both toyed with the use of Technicolor in 3D when it wasn't really that common. And both offered a lot of projects with up and coming people behind and in front of the camera. By 1969, He'd already made a name for himself as a prominent film and TV producer, hopping from studio to studio. He already had a range of popular TV shows of the 60s, including Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Lost in Space, Land of the Giants, and The Time Tunnel. He was a guy who loved presenting worlds of fantasy and the unknown. He believed that nothing was impossible to film. It just needed the right people to make it happen. But more than anything, he wanted to go back to his main passion, movies. It would be Irwin's wife, Shelia, who brought him attention to the newly published Paul Galico book, The Poseidon Adventure. Galico at the time was more remembered for being a sports writer than a novelist. 
even wrote the story that would be used for the famous Gary Cooper baseball movie, The Pride of the Yankees. He had also written a variety of stories, from fantasy with Thomasia, the cat who thought she was God, to war with the snow goose, to children's stories with Manx Mouse. But his inspiration with writing The Poseidon Adventure came from an experience while sailing on the famous ocean liner, the Queen Mary, which has now become a famous tourist spot in Long Beach, California. But back when the ship was still in service, Galico was on the boat when the ship was dealing with a rough squall. The waves had gotten high enough that he thought the ship would capsize. Galico had a reputation, but still hadn't written any novels that had a strong legacy or even big sales. Erwin Allen liked the Poseidon Adventure. He thought along with having a large scale disaster that would look amazing on the big screen, he liked that the story had an element he called the Walter Mini Syndrome. Taking an ordinary person and putting them in an extraordinary situation and having them rise to overcome it. He first went to 20th Century Fox, but found out that AFCO Embassy had already secured the rights to the novel. Irwin's film company, Kemp Productions, worked out a three-picture deal in which they would make three movies with them. The Poseidon Adventure would be one of them. Fox would put up half the $5 million budget, while a friend of Irwin would match that. This was tough on Fox, as I should know two things. First, Fox was not in a good place financially after the mega hit The Sound of Music had them, well, ironically lose that fortune trying to recreate that success. Star, Dr. Doolittle, and Hello, Dolly were all very expensive musicals that would try and fail to recapture the Harmony Zeitgeist. This resulted in Fox trying to cut costs wherever they could. Secondly, the new wave period of movies I mentioned included Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate, and Easy Rider. They all had low budgets, more creative control from the filmmakers, and were hits with critics and audiences. But more importantly, with young audiences who saw these as the kind of movies that spoke to them. Fox was weary of trying to make a big budgeted disaster movie that wasn't trying to speak to the youth. Irwin wasn't interested in trying to make some kind of political statement, he just wanted to entertain. He got to work with his team, ensuring that he kept track of the budget and would deliver on time for the 1972 Christmas season. I should point out that within the novel The Poseidon Adventure, the story was essentially the same. Boat capsizes, a group of survivors leading a larger group to find help, a reverend leading the group, and the various trials that it takes to get to the steel hull. The screenplay would end up following many of the same things, including the character names. The script would first be written by Oscar-nominated Wendell Mays, who had also written The Spirit of St. Louis, Anatomy of a Murder, and North to Alaska. Another writer was also brought on board in 1971, Sterling Silifan. His background was primarily a lot of television, that included The Mickey Mouse Club, Perry Mason, and Route 66 but was also a recent Oscar winner with his script for the Sidney Poitier-led noir In the Heat of the Night. Fox would bring in Roland Neen to direct. He was a longtime cinematographer turned director who was more experienced in British character dramas than disaster movies. Some of these would include the Hayley Mills drama The Chalk Garden, Judy Garland's final movie I Could Go On Singing, and another Christmas movie I'll have to cover at some point, Scrooge. Roland was brought on to ensure that the Poseidon Adventure would have compelling drama to go with the disaster. Had the Fox executives had actually read the novel, they would have known that that was never going to be an issue. Th that's not to say that the Poseidon Adventure is a groundbreaking exploration of the soul. It'll never be seen as great theater. But it does do a good job at juggling through a variety of characters, making you care about every single one of them. What helps is that the tragedy of this situation is highlighted to the furthest degree. Take a listen to the scene here involving a set of grandparents that get trapped in a boat, really contemplating whether they can even get off or not. We're never going to see our little grandson, are we? Oh, darling, you have to think positively. We'll see him. We'll see him. If any of us are saved, I hope it's... Those two children, they still have their whole lives in front of them. 
Now, stop giving our lives away. We're going to come out of this. All of us. Now, you just sit here while Daddy, I... Daddy, you are a good man. You're such a good man. <laughs> The reason that this comes off as more heartbreaking is that the Poseidon Adventure gives us time with these people before the catastrophic wave that hits the boat. Within the movie's first 20 minutes that were shot on the real Queen Mary, we get a lot of moments with those passengers, or at least the ones that we're pretty sure are not going to perish within the ballroom. They all have their own trials and tribulations, their own reasons for traveling, or celebrating the new year. Some are visiting their parents or grandchildren, while others are on their way to something bigger. That's the case for our lead, Reverend Frank Scott, played by Gene Hackman. He's a man of the cloth who's already a rebel within the church, believing that people are more capable than they think. God is pretty busy. He's got a long-term plan for humanity that stretches far beyond our comprehension. So it's not reasonable to expect him to concern himself with the individual. The individual is important only to the extent of providing a creative link between the past and the future, in his children, or in his grandchildren, or in the contribution he makes to humanity. Therefore, don't pray to God to solve your problems. Pray to that part of God within you have the guts to fight for yourself. God wants brave souls. He wants winners, not quitters. If you can't win, at least try to win. God loves triers. Isn't that right, Robin? Right. So, what resolution should we make for the new year? Resolve to let God know that you have the guts and the will to do it alone. Resolve to fight for yourselves. Resolve to fight for yourself. This is the key statement for the entire movie. This is a reverend who doesn't just want sheep or for everyone to be spoon-fed everything. He wants people to understand that those with the will to keep going and keep trying, then God will reward that. This may be a big reason on how he's seen as rebellious. This is fairly close to the statement, God helps those who help themselves, which itself is often confused for a scriptural quote from the Bible. This is completely false. A lot of quotes are in fact the opposite. One being Psalms 116.6, God takes the side of the helpless. When I was at the end of my rope, he saved me. And the other being Matthew 5.3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What I'm getting at is that Frank's teachings are not biblical based, but rather his own viewpoint. His philosophy is put to the test as the central plot is focusing on a lot of people that might seem weak in real life, but end up being the only hope for survivors later on. This is also a big reason that the majority of people within the group are older. These are the people that would honestly seem more likely to go in a real disaster, but they want to prove themselves otherwise. Maybe this was also in line with the idea that cruising was primarily for the middle age crowd, but also a metaphor for old Hollywood, proving they could still be in the cultural game while offering something smaller budgets couldn't. We're going to take a short break, but we'll get into the characters, the use of the Christmas tree, and of course, parts of my honeymoon. Ho, 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 ho! Merry Christmas! Greetings, holiday shoppers. I'm Joseph Wade, and I host a podcast called Christmas Creeps. My band of merry mischief makers and I dissect holiday movies and specials all year round in search of the true meaning of Christmas. So whether you can't resist the urge to watch Home Alone in June, or you worship at the altar of mutant killer snowmen, Christmas Creeps is the podcast for the Grinch in all of us. Check us out at christmascreeps.com or wherever you download podcasts. And now back to the show with our Christmas movie expert, Robert Nicholas. Good at 
afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your report today in Jamaica. I'm sorry I got a little too in-depth with the history of the Poseidon Adventure, but I have found the history and context too good not to pass up. I'll be getting to the almost Christmas aspect soon along with some other fun observations as well. Tonight's entertainment is a Queen tribute band and dirty stand-up at 2200 hours. Please, don't cancel them. Let's continue to cruise on the digital seas, which will be smooth sailing for the night. You all have a fun evening. So along with Gene Hackman as our lead, who are the others in the group? We also have a detective lieutenant, Mike, played by Ernest Borgnine, and his former prostitute wife, Linda, played by Stella Stevens. We also have an older couple on their way to meet their grandchild, Manny, played by Jack Albertson, and his wife, Belle, played by Shelley Winters. We have our set of kids heading to meet their parents, teenager Susan, played by Pamela Sue Martin, and her younger brother Robin, played by Eric Shea. Some of the solo guests are bachelor haberdasher James, played by Red Buttons, the singer of the ship's band Nani, played by Carol Lindley, and an injured crewman, Akers, played by Roddy McDowell. How do they end up in a group together? Well, they are the only ones that use the Christmas tree to get to safety. Yep, it's time to bring up how the tree plays into the plot. So it's New Year's Eve and the ship is making its final voyage from New York to Athens, Greece. At the helm is Catherine Harrison, played by Leslie Nielsen. And yes, this was before he would become famous for spoof movies like the Naked Gun series. He was still primarily seen as a serious actor. Anyway, the ship is sailing into choppy waters in addition to the high speed it's traveling at the insistence of the new owners who are scrapping the ship for metal. Keep going slow ahead. Start taking on ballast. Aye, sir. Order full ahead, Captain. I have already told you, Mr. Lenarcos, we don't have enough ballast yet to run full ahead. I suggest we talk privately. Line up, start taking on ballast. I did not suggest full ahead, Captain. As the new owner's representative on this ship, I ordered it. Damn it, man, the Poseidon is too fine a lady to be rushed to the junkyard on her last voyage. We are already three days behind schedule. And it's costing my consortium thousands of dollars every day to maintain a wrecking crew. I demand we dock Monday night. And I can't afford to gamble with the lives of my passengers. Your business is to deliver this ship where we want it, when we want it. Running an unstable ship at full ahead is dangerous. I'm sure... Especially one as old as this. I'm sure I don't have to remind you of my legal right to have you relieved of command. Three other officers aboard this ship have their master's license. Now, order full ahead. You irresponsible bastard. Full ahead! Aye, sir. A lot of the passengers end up seasick, but most recover enough to attend the party. This is where that awful Christmas tree is being displayed. Everyone gears up with a countdown and is ready to sing All Lang Sang. But the bridge is another story. The captain is summoned with reports of a nearby underground earthquake heading in the ship's direction. An impact is inevitable. They attempt to turn it to lessen the impact, but it's no match for nature. In a scene that's honestly still impressive, we see the ballroom start to tilt. People are trying to hold on, but gravity starts sending them towards the walls, which slowly becomes a floor. The more angled the room becomes, the more the tumbles turns into falls. We hear screams. People are flying in every direction. The poor people that clanged onto the tables start to see they made a terrible decision as they find themselves stuck with no way to land. The heavier objects become a source of terror, the electricity goes out, and it's clear that half of the passengers were killed instantly from the capsizing. By the time the tilting stops and the survivors are now on the ceiling, they haven't even taken in the next horror that awaits them, water that will eventually drown them. It's not until this happens. Hey, uh, Reverend Scott, my, my name is James Martin. Do you think it might be a better idea if we went up? What the hell are you talking about? I mean, it seems to me that any rescue attempt would have to come through the hull. The hull? You mean through the bottom? My God, that's right. We're floating upside down. We've got to climb up. Akers! 
Where's that lead to, the place you're standing on? To the galley, sir. Well, you stay right there. We're coming up. Akers, is there a ladder up there, something we can use to climb up with? Oh, no, sir. This is the linen service area. What we need is a... Something like that. A Christmas tree. Clear the way! Clear. Come on, clear the way! We're gonna lift on three. Get on. One! Two! For God's sake, Reverend, what you're doing is suicide! We're cut off from the rest of the world. They can't get to us. Maybe we can get to them. You've said enough. Now get out of the way. Pray for us, but don't do this. Climbing to another deck will kill you all. And sitting on our butts is not going to help us either. Maybe by climbing out of here, we can save ourselves. You got any sense, you'll come along with us. Grab a hole. On three. One, two. Up. Holy fuck. It's hairy. I'm forward. As awful as that tree looked, it was at least tall enough to touch the ceiling. It's at the encouragement of Gene Hackman's character Frank that tells everyone that they need to start heading to the bottom, which is now the top. The way out is up the Christmas tree, and the characters I brought up were the only ones that make the climb. The rest stay behind to wait for help. With the ship upside down and no watertight compartments to stop the flow, it doesn't take long for the ballroom to finally start filling up. Frank tries to get more survivors out, but everyone also tries to climb at the same time. The weight of everyone sends the tree falling and with no time to upright it. With water now coming in, Frank and the others have no choice but to leave and make their way up. This is where anything Christmas related stops. The movie becomes the survival story it was meant to be. Without going into too much depth, we follow them for the remainder as they ascend through ducks, funnels, and eventually the engine room for the chance to be rescued. I'll reveal that, well, not everyone makes it, but that's what elevates the Poseidon adventure. Everyone is in the same boat, both literally and figuratively. For those that have never been on a cruise ship, you'd be surprised to learn that it's more than just a floating hotel. This is practically like an old-fashioned small town on water. The bigger the boat, the more obvious this is. Your room size and placement depends on how much you're willing to spend. The food options will drive how much your waist size is going to expand. The dining room is going to be something much more traditional. Or perhaps the buffet if you want to eat yourself silly with macaroni and cheese and chocolate chip cookies. There's a never-ending supply of entertainment. With my boat, there were tons of pools, dance shows, a Beatles impersonator group, water slides, a carousel, and even an escape room. But it's also perfect if you don't want to do anything, but just lay around. It resembles a small society also because of the staff that go above and beyond to make everyone happy, even if it's not always acknowledged. I mean, did you know that the waiter that serves you in the dining hall will be your server for the remainder of the cruise? Yeah, he'll be the one to remember your drink order, so... Please be nice to them. The same goes for your room attendant, who will remember your name and leave little funny towel animals in your room every night. Those were all the things that my wife and I got to experience all through Royal Caribbean, which happens to be one of the main brands of the cruising industry. Cruising today is way different than it was back in the 70s when the Poseidon Adventure is set. Our ship, the Oasis of the Seas, was one of the newer boats coming in at over 230 feet high and at a weight of over 200,000 tons. And that's not even the biggest ship in the world. More companies are trying to reach similar sizes, but older ships like the Titanic and even the Poseidon are going to seem puny in comparison. The movie ship was only around 55 feet in height at maybe the tallest. I mean, I don't know. The movie never really says what its height is, but I'm going off what the Queen Mary's size is. This was about the average height of these kinds of old-fashioned ships, which were initially designed to be the only transport across oceans. That was until the jet age made airplanes the dominant transport. Without much purpose, it did continue to bring people back and forth from Europe to the United States. Watching now in 2024 makes it more clear that little about the ship had been modernized. The Poseidon was clearly not going to last a lot longer, as the movie even states that this was to be the final voyage. This explains why the boat looks intentionally dated with its Art Deco style dining room and a captain's bridge that looks more like the one from Titanic. 
Because it was too expensive for these kinds of companies to build their own boats, it made more sense to purchase older ocean liners and to, well, retrofit them. This often meant keeping a lot of the old design and even the same rooms while adding a few modern amenities. This wasn't seen as appealing to younger crowds. This did light the hearts of the middle aged crowd, looking to recapture the nostalgia for a simpler time while seeing the world. This is probably why cruising got its stigma that it was primarily for older people. This also gave a good reason for a slightly older cast in the Poseidon Adventure. It starts as future scrap metal, but by the time it capsized, it was as if the ship itself had awoken to take one last stand to show that it still had a lot of power. Filled with machines that could explode at any minute, endless corridors that could lead to dead ends, and a steel hull that could ultimately drown our survivors if rescue doesn't come. The ship that everyone once saw as a safe haven was now a monster that could swallow every soul before sinking. In the 1970s, the Poseidon Adventure was a showcase of the old guard Hollywood, trying to show that it could still make a classic epic and have muscle alongside the newcomers. Watching it in the 2020s is still entertaining for different reasons. By trying to appear more hip by having a 70s influence on this 30s ship, its attempt at modernization almost feels camp. And again, this is before the giant tidal wave. I'm talking about the events beforehand that are prominent at the New Year's celebration. Art Deco meets Disco. The giant aluminum Christmas tree versus the glitz that had long since passed. This is something that could have only been made within this time period. So now comes the big question. Is The Poseidon Adventure an almost Christmas movie? This is honestly a tough one, as the theme of the movie is about coming together to survive along with the late December time frame. A Christmas tree does play a crucial role. We do even have a religious connection with our reverend character having to become a leader at his darkest point. The movie fanatic in me really wants to give this a 5 out of 5 on that scale, but this is a Christmas themed podcast and I do need to judge it on that scale. I would be more inclined to call this more of a straight New Year's movie than Christmas. Unlike the holidays, which is about our connection as people, New Year's is about our promise to change and better ourselves with new challenges. But they are in proximity, so for that sake, I'll say yes. The Poseidon Adventure will count in a way people talk about Die Hard as a Christmas movie. The latter may have a stronger case, as that one is at least set on Christmas Eve, but I don't see why the Poseidon Adventure should be left out. The theme of human survival is similar. For the skill of an almost Christmas movie, uh, I'll give the Poseidon Adventure a 4 out of 5. It's a disaster movie that may have Christmas in it, but it's really the last thing that anyone is thinking about. If there's anything that I'll take away from the Poseidon Adventure, aside from the ship turning upside down and a unique thriller that jump-started a major disaster period in the industry, are, well, two things. First, it's probably the most epic way to start a new year, or at least until Ghostbusters 2 had that team stopping an evil spirit from possessing a baby. Secondly, it made me grateful. Not just that the honeymoon didn't face a maritime disaster at midnight on New Year's, but also that once I got off the boat, I now had a great new life with the woman that I love. As a bonus, she's also into Christmas and classic movies like I am. In all seriousness though, it does reflect the kind of movies that I do want to cover on Almost Christmas. I've got more coming, but more importantly, my next episode will be a deep dive. But otherwise, what do you think? Do you have a better case of the Poseidon Adventure qualifying as a Christmas movie? Or am I just nuts? I mean, I already know that I am, but I'm more than happy to hear that from you. I promise you that you won't have to wait as long for my next episode, but I'll keep you posted on when that'll happen. But we will be ringing the bells again soon with another Christmas classic. Until then, 
I'll see you all real soon. Thank you for joining us on this sleigh ride into the magical world of Christmas movies. Check us out for weekly rides into your favorite Christmas classics and their histories. Be sure to give us a positive review on iTunes if you like what you heard. And don't forget to follow us on social media on Facebook and Instagram for updates and special news. Consider subscribing on Patreon in order to help keep the show going and to gain access to some special gifts not available to the public. Merry Monday to all, and to all a good night. See you next week. Cut. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap.